All right, so in Isaiah chapter 2, what are we focusing on? It's not just Isaiah. We're going to be going through many references in the Old Testament and also in the New Testament. And what I want to explain today is the difference between the day of the Lord and the day of Christ. Now, if you've read your Bible a little bit at all, it's a little bit more of a Bible study. We're going to go a little bit deeper tonight into these issues. But um, you'll see the day of the Lord comes up many times throughout the Bible. You, 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 if you decide to do a Bible study and just look at all the, the places that the day of the Lord is mentioned, you'll find it many times. It's riddled throughout the Old Testament, especially throughout the prophets. You know, Isaiah and Ezekiel and, and Joel and Zechariah and, and, and a lot of these places in the Old Testament. Now, I'm not going to hit every mention of the day of the Lord. We're going to hit many of them, but not that by far it's not exhaustive. But we will hit every mention of the day of Christ because obviously, for one, that's only found in the New Testament. The day of Christ, Christ was named and mentioned in the New Testament or um, the day of Jesus Christ. Um, these are the terms that we're going to be looking at in the New Testament. But um, hopefully, <coughs> by the end of the sermon, you'll have a more clear understanding of the timeline of events as they're laid out in the Bible, of how they're going to happen. <coughs> the day of the Lord is an extremely monumental day that is going to take place in the future. And we get different pieces of information about that day, about when, what's going to be happening on that day, about, about the, um, and, and when it's going exactly to be happening based on other events that happen. So, it, like I said, it's going to be a little deeper, but try to stick with me. There's a lot that we could learn from this study. And the first thing that we're going to notice is regarding the, um, the day of the Lord, is this keep your finger in Isaiah 2 and flip over if you would to Revelation chapter 6. We're going to be doing a lot of comparisons between the Old Testament and Revelation, at least a few of them. So um, keep one marker in Revelation. We're going to be going to Revelation 6. And I want to show you some similarities between what we learn in Revelation and what we learn in the Old Testament. Now, I'm going to start off right off the bat by saying this. When you look at the prophecies from the Old Testament, your main understanding and your main source for, for everything ought to be coming more from the New Testament, especially the book of Revelation. That is the book that God has used. I mean, even the name alone, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's something that's being revealed. It's all about these future events that are going to happen that God has revealed unto us for those that live in the last days. So, when you look up what's going to happen, obviously that is the main source to get our doctrine from. But there's still a lot we can gather and a lot we can learn from the Old Testament. Now, just to give you an example of why we can't just base everything we believe off Old Testament Scripture when it comes to prophecy, you know, a lot of people just get this wrong because these sayings are a little bit darker. They're not as quite as clear. And as you'll notice when we go through this, it'll reference different aspects and the, 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 the exact timing of things isn't always, um, you know, it, it kind of gives you a lot of information or different information at once without being extremely explicit about when all of the different events are going to happen. More like it does in the New Testament. You've got vials being opened in order. You've got trumpets being blown in order. And you can see a very clear order of events in Revelation. So we're going to see kind of how these things tie into Revelation a little bit. But the bigger concept that I want to drive home, and you'll notice this, pay attention as we go through all the references to the day of the Lord is that it is an overwhelming time of trouble. People are fearful. It's a time of judgment. It's basically a bad day. It's not a day you're going to be looking forward to at all. The references to the day of the Lord. So one of the things that, that struck me in this chapter, uh, look at verse number 10. He says, Enter into the rock and hide thee in the dust, for fear of the Lord and for the glory of His majesty. He's talking about people that are going to be you know, hiding in the rocks. And we're going to, in Revelation 6, you'll, you'll see why this sounds real familiar. But um, he says, Enter into the rocks, hide thee from the dust for the fear of the Lord, because God is coming down and He's angry. And so people are going to be trying to hide from them. So in verse 12 it says, For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty. 
and upon everyone that is lifted up, and ye shall be brought low. And it goes on and on for many verses, talking about the high mountains and the high cedars and people who are just lifted up with so much pride. The day of the Lord is a day that signifies God bringing people down and bringing them low. And, and man who has just been lifted up in so much pride that God steps in and he says, you know what? You are lifted up way too much. I'm going to make you low. And what's, you know, there's many ways that people can be brought low, but when you take away the things that they have, you know, normally people become prideful because they have a lot of rich, because they have a lot of goods, because everything seems to be going well for them. They have great health and everything is going great. So they get lifted up in pride. They get lifted up in themselves to become very arrogant. And um, what God's going to do is going to come down and, and basically bring a big whooping through them and, and, and remove their riches, remove their, their, comfort pla their comfortable places and make them realize that they aren't as good as they think they are and that there is a mighty power and there is a mighty God that, that, um, that exists and demands, their, um, demands respect from his creation. Now, um, let's keep reading here. We're going to see the fear of God in the people when, when the day of the Lord of hosts comes upon the proud and the lofty. Verse number 19 says, And they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for fear of the Lord. And then again in verse 21, To go into the clefts of the rocks and into the tops of the ragged rocks for fear of the Lord. I mean, people are looking for any possible place to hide their face from the Lord that's coming down. They're scared to death. And when you realize God is so almighty and powerful, all throughout the Bible, when people come like face to face with God, they, they fall on their face and tremble and shake at fear of just the mighty power, the almighty power of God's presence alone is enough for people just to, to fall. I mean, the strongest person, the, 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 the most proud person, oh man, I would never do that. You know, these, these arrogant people who think that, you know, they're, they're basically willing to spit in God's face. If they were actually to come face to face with God, there is no, they're all talk. They're just a bunch of blowhards. They, they want to sound tough and they want to sound cool. But if they literally were face to face with God, they would be down on their face. The Bible says that, that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of the glory of God the Father. It's going to happen. Everybody's going to bow down. Everybody's going to be made low. There is going to be no pride left over in men when they come face to face with God and his judgment comes down upon them. They're going to be looking for these little holes in the rocks and anything to come between them and God. Look at Revelation chapter 6, verse number 12. And we're going to see some, some key events that happen every time or almost every time the day of the Lord. Now, the day of the Lord is mentioned quite a bit. One other point I want to make is that sometimes, you know, in the Old Testament, there are multiple prophecies going on oftentimes. There is going to be a more um, short-term prophecy that's going to be happening. You know, judgment coming upon a specific nation, a specific city. But that usually is tied in also with a greater or more long-term prophecy of, of something that's going to happen <coughs> later in the future. And the people in, uh, in Jesus' day were a little bit confused about this because the Old Testament isn't quite as explicitly clear. They have a lot of clues. There's a lot of information, but they got a little bit wrong. They thought when Jesus Christ came back the first time, he was going to set up his earthly kingdom and reign from Jerusalem over all the world. And they see that because they'll see other scripture that talks about that reign of Christ. And they didn't quite fully understand that there's actually two comings, that he's going to come once to come to be the lamb slain from the foundation of the world and then come back again a second time to rule and reign and to set up that kingdom. They kind of got some of it mixed up and confused. They didn't quite understand it fully because they didn't have all the information. Well, now we have all the information that God has laid out for us. And that's why I say, you know, we use the revealed to, to help us understand more of what was unrevealed back in the, in the Old Testament. But nonetheless, there's still a lot of great information that we can use in the Old Testament, and especially talking about the day of the Lord. So in Revelation 6, look at verse number 12. Remember that the people we saw in Isaiah, they were, they were getting into the holes of the rocks and trying to hide from the face of God. Verse number 12 says, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. 
And keep this in mind, too, the great earthquake. We're going to see this come up again and again as we look at the day of the Lord. It wasn't necessarily in Isaiah chapter 2, but you're going to see it pop up more and more. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. Many scriptural references are talking about this event. Now, just use a little bit of common sense. Just how often, how many times do you think an event like this is going to take place where the, the, the sun is completely darkened and the moon turns into blood and stars are falling from heaven? This is a pretty catastrophic event. This is not something that, oh yeah, you know, that happens every hundred years. You know, this is going to happen. No. When the Bible talks about these things and these extreme of, of an event, we can put the pieces together and say these are talking about the same event. And we're, that's one of the things we're going to notice. He uses the same phrase, the day of the Lord, over and over again. And you'll see these things being repeated because he's talking about the same event. So verse number 13 of Revelation 6 says, And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men. Now, do you think these people might be people that have a little bit of pride? The rulers, right? The chief, the top people, the great men, the rich men. This is the same people he's talking about in Isaiah 2. And every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountain and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who, sh who shall be able to stand? The day of the Lord signifies the day that God starts to pour out his wrath upon the proud, upon the people of the earth. Keep that in mind. It's very important. When we look at the day of the Lord, that is, that is what is the, the beginning of God's wrath being poured out. Now, I know everybody here has, has, knows our stance on the end times events and how we believe it's going to play out. We believe that we are, you know, are post-tribulational in, in terms of when Jesus Christ is going to come back and rapture the saints, but pre-wrath. So there's a time that, that is going to take place where the rapture, we've gone through tribulation, we've gone through trouble, we've gone through persecution. Christ is going to come back. He's going to save us. He's going to rapture us up. And at that point, God pours out his wrath. Well, the day of the Lord is the day that signifies God's wrath beginning to be poured out. So keep that in mind. Flip back. Did you keep your place in Isaiah? Still keep a marker in Revelation. We're going to be going to Revelation 9 next. Put a marker there. Flip back to Isaiah, but go to chapter 13. We're going to see another reference for the day of the Lord in Isaiah 13. Verse number 6 of Isaiah 13 says, Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Again, a negative reference to the day of the Lord. You know, howl, it's, it's, a, it's destruction is coming from God. Verse 7, Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt. He's saying your, your heart, people's hearts are just going to be completely just melting. Just no hope whatsoever because God is becoming with destruction. Verse number 8. And they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. Verse 9. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger. God's coming down angry. This is the day of the Lord. There is wrath. There is fierce anger to lay the land desolate. His point is to come and destroy the whole land. He says, I'm going to make this land desolate. Nothing's going to live there. And it says, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. God's bringing his judgment down. Verse 10, look at this. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light... For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. We're in verse number 10. 
The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. Number 11. And I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity, and I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease, and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. So again, we see the arrogancy, the proud, the sun and moon being darkened. All these things are events. It's all talking about the same exact event. Verse 12, I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. Therefore, I will shake the heavens and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. Again, God is coming down in great wrath and great anger. And it says the earth shall remove out of his place. This could be a great earthquake. An earthquake is another reference to this same event. And it's, we can't just ignore these things that are happening. Turn, if you would, to Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. We're we'll starting in verse number one of Joel chapter two. Bible reads, "Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand." To so describe the day of the Lord now, verse two: a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains. A great people and a strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. Now, I want to point this out because I'm going to get into a little bit more detail about what he's referring to in Joel chapter 2. But again, we see the day of the Lord. It comes. It's a day of darkness. It's a great time of great trouble. God's coming down to, to bring his wrath. And one of the things we see, I don't believe that the day of the Lord is an entire time period, but the, the day is still a day. But the day of the Lord, I believe, kicks off the entire time period that God is pouring out his wrath, which is going to be roughly three and a half years, a little bit less, that God is going to be pouring out his wrath on this earth. And as you go through Revelation, you'll see, I mean, all the things that he's doing, it takes time to accomplish those things. And there's even time given of how long the sun's dark and everything else that's going on. So what we'll see in the Old Testament a lot of times is references to other events that happen during this whole time that God is pouring out his wrath. But the reference is made to the day of the Lord. Okay. So the specific, it, it, I do believe it, it refers to the day of the Lord in a broader sense of just that this whole time of wrath. But the day, I still believe the day is, is a specific day. It is the first day that God's wrath begins to be poured out and then everything else follows uh, as a result. So what we're seeing here is a reference to something that's in Revelation chapter 9. And, I, and I'm going to make the connection here in just a minute. We're going to read through a little bit of Joel chapter 2. Look at verse number 3. This is talking about a great and strong people. It says there's never been anybody like this. And even after this, there's not going to be anything like this. This is a brand new thing that's happened. There's never been anything like this before. Verse 3, A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. It's talking about the destructive force of these great mighty people that are coming that... Hey, everything's great before them, but then when they come and they get through, it's all destroyed and desolate and, you know, it's like a war zone, right? Um, verse number four, the appearance of them is as the appearance of horses and as horsemen, so shall they run. This is real interesting. It's talking about this great mighty people. They look like horses. Verse number five. Like the noise of chariots. Keep that in mind. This is the sound. They look like horses. And it says they are going to run like horsemen. And, and like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap. Like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble as a strong people set in battle array. So just imagine this sound coming forth of just, you know, a whole bunch of horses running and this rumbling of a great blazing fire. It says... Um, Verse number six, before their face, the people shall be much pained. All faces shall be, shall gather blackness. They shall run like the mighty men. Now listen to this, it says, they shall climb the wall like men of war. 
They shall march everyone on his ways. They shall not break their ranks. Neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk everyone in his path. And when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark and the stars shall withdraw their shining. So again, we see the sun and moon being darkened in reference to these days. But look at uh, Revelation now, chapter 9, with this passage in mind in Joel chapter 2. Revelation chapter 9. Start reading in verse number 1. Revelation chapter 9. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. So here we saw in that last uh, reference in Joel chapter 2, the sun and the moon shall be dark. Well, we see here the sun being darkened by the reason of the smoke that came out of this pit. Verse number 3, And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. That what we're reading in, Revelation, or in Joel chapter 2, I believe, is the reference to these locusts that are going to be coming up out of the earth in Revelation chapter 9. And you think about all the descriptions that I was giving in Joel chapter 2, that they're going to... Um, they're going to come and they're going to have, they're not going to break their ranks, right? They're going to be completely coming in a force and their sound is going to be a sound of this, this chariots coming at them. And um, locusts, you think like insects when they, when they travel together and stuff and you see this big swarm of locusts, they don't break their ranks. They're going to be coming as this big massive cloud, this big force coming in to the city. And uh, look at verse number four. It says, And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Verse number five, And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months, and their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. Look at verse number 7. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. Joel chapter 2 said the appearance, they had the appearance of horses. In Revelation chapter 9, verse number 7, the locusts said they looked like horses prepared unto battle. And on their heads were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. So pretty amazing creatures here. I mean, something no one's ever seen before. There's never been the like. That's what it said in Joel chapter 2. And just by reading the description, yeah, I've never seen a locust that looked like a horse, that had hair like a woman, that had crown, and had teeth like a lion. It's kind of a scary picture, though, when you, when you think about, about that type of a locust being, you know, unleashed on the earth. But look at what it says in verse number 9. It says, And they had breastplates, as it were, breastplates of iron. Now you think about it, it said, When they fell on the sword, that they weren't hurt by it. Well, that would make sense if they had breastplates, like breastplates of iron, like an armor, that they're not going to be hurt by the sword. And it says, And the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots, of many horses running to battle. It all lines up perfectly with what we see in Joel chapter 2. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. Joel chapter 2, I believe, is describing exactly what we see in Revelation chapter 9. Both of them line up perfectly with the day of the Lord and His wrath being poured out. This is a supernatural event. And you know, in part of our belief, we don't believe that God is going to pour out His wrath upon us. And His wrath is signified by all of these supernatural Natural occurrences that happen that are that are you, this never happened before. Things like this, like these locusts being unleashed from hell to, to terrorize men and to hurt them and to, and to punish them. We are not going to have any part of this because this is going on during God's wrath. And this happens, this all starts with the day of the Lord. You're in Joel chapter 2. Look at verse number 11. The Bible reads, 
We're flipping back and forth, remember, between Revelation and, and now Joel. Joel chapter 2, verse 11 says, And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? Therefore also now saith the Lord, Turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning. So at this time that this is going on, he's saying, Look, the, great, the day of the Lord is terrible. It's going to be a horrible time. We're, thank God we're not going to be a part of this. But he's even pleading with the people here in Joel chapter 2. He's saying, look, turn unto me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. You know, he's trying to break this proud people with all these things. And rend your heart and not your garments. He's like, don't just put this out where it's Look, rend your heart. Break your heart and, and, and finally break down and just come to me and, and receive salvation. He says, and uh, turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. He's saying, look, God can still withhold this stuff. Just turn to him. Just receive Christ. Receive God. It says in verse 14, Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. This is the heart of God. He's bringing this great extreme punishment on him, but he's still looking like, look, just turn unto me. But you know what? It's not going to happen. Go back to Revelation chapter 9. Look at verse number 20. We get more inform information in Revelation chapter 9. Even though God, that's what God wants them to do, this people is so proud and so lifted up and so stiff-necked. Verse number 20 of Revelation 9 says, And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. After all this judgment coming down from God, obviously coming from God, these people still kept to worshiping their devils, worshiping their idols, and to, to committing all their murders and sorceries, fornication, like all these terrible sins that they're doing. They don't care. And you know well, the reason why is because most of these people are reprobate. They've already taken the mark of the beast. They can't even believe and get saved. And that's why, you know, just as it was with Pharaoh, when all these plagues came upon him, and you think, how in the world can you not just break down and, and just say, I'm sorry, God, like you got me. You know, I'm not, you, you, you've humbled me, okay? I, uh, this is enough. Pharaoh didn't do it. Why? Because his heart was hardened. And people that take the mark of the beast, their heart's going to be hardened also. Turn, if you would, to 2 Peter chapter number 3. You don't have to keep it. We're, we're done going back and forth for now between Revelation and, and the Old Testament. We're going to be getting a little bit more into the New Testament now. But um, I'm going to read for you from Zephaniah chapter 1. Just one more reference, just kind of showing a little bit more detail about the day of the Lord and, and a lot of the common attributes. Uh, Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 14 says, The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasteth greatly, even the voice of the day of the Lord. The mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. You'll notice, as we've already read these other passages, the same things keep popping up. It's dark. It's gloomy. It's wrath. It's trouble. It's nothing good, nothing to look forward to. It says, a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. And I will bring distress upon them, upon men, that they shall walk like blind men, because they have sinned against the Lord, and their blood shall be poured out as dust, and their flesh as the dung. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. Nothing but bad news when we're talking about the day of the Lord. There's nothing good about this day. Nothing to look forward to. 2 Peter chapter 3, look at verse number 3. The Bible says, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, 
walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. A lot of people are going to be mocking, saying, yeah, right, Jesus is coming back. The louder we're going to be preaching about, hey, Christ is coming back. This is going to happen. They're going to say, yeah, pfft, that was some 2,000 years ago. You think he's coming back now? And they're going to mock and, and, and have nothing to do with it. No belief in the Bible. No belief in God. It says in verse 5, For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. See, people today, they're willingly ignorant of this stuff. They've heard about it. They just don't want to believe it. They choose not to. They're willingly ignorant. They're willingly ignorant of the fact that God caused a great flood in judgment upon this earth. That God had gotten so angry with the people that were living so wickedly back in the days of Noah that he said, all right, I'm going to pour out a little bit of wrath. I'm going to, I'm going to cause a flood and everybody's going to die except for Noah except for this man and his family that I deemed righteous. He's going to spare Noah, but everybody else gets wiped out. People are willingly ignorant of that. They don't want to hear about that. They don't care about that. And all that is, that's a, a warning for us to say, look, God, God's done it once before, and he's going to do it again. He did it with water before. Next time he's doing it with fire. Look what it says. It says in verse 6, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished, but the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, the same word of God, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that the one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. He's saying, okay, just because it's been 2,000 years now since Christ was on this earth, don't think that that means anything to God. Because to God, a thousand years is just like one day. He's like, yeah, that's just like yesterday. Because God is outside of time. It doesn't matter. A thousand years, it doesn't mean that God's not coming back, which is what they were saying in Second Peter chapter 3. They're saying, yeah, pff, where is the sign of his coming? Well, he's not coming back. Everything's been going fine ever since, you know, the Father, ever since Jesus Christ died. Yeah, he's not coming back. All these, if all these things happen, he hasn't come back now. He ain't coming back. That's the attitude they have. And he's saying, no, 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 don't worry about it being a couple thousand years, because that's like a day to God. Verse number nine, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. He keeps his promises, as some men count slack as, but is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The reason why God let things go on for so long is because he wants us to come to repentance. He's merciful and he's long-suffering, but there comes to a point where God will stop being merciful and long-suffering. And that's the day of the Lord. Verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burnt up. Now, flip back, if you would, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're going to see a little bit more about the timing of the day of the Lord, when these events are going to happen. We just saw in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, the day of the Lord is going to come as a thief in night. We're going to see that same exact phrase given in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 1, the Bible reads, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Again, the day of the Lord being referred to as destruction is not a good day. Uh, even the, the travail of a woman with child was used in the Old Testament to describe the day of the Lord. And he's saying, look, the day of the Lord is going to come upon them as a thief because they're going to say, oh, everything's fine, everything's good, just like it was in the days of Noah. Oh, everything's fine, Noah, you're crazy. And God came and destroyed it just like it was in the days of Lot. You know, the angels were trying to get Lot out of there and everyone else, they didn't care. They didn't see the judgment coming, but it came. But, um, you know, when they say peace and safe, safety, then sudden destruction is going to happen quickly. Verse 4, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. 
We know that this day is coming. We're, you know, we're not in darkness, we're in light. It says, Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. Verse number 9, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. We're not appointed unto the wrath. That's why we believe in a pre-wrath, a pre-wrath rapture of the saints. We are not going to be going through the wrath of God. Flip back to chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians. Because in the verse 1 started off saying, But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need to write unto you. And he's referring to the day of the Lord. Look at verse number, or chapter 4, verse 15. He says, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now this is important for the timing because he was just talking about, this is the rapture. This is talking about us being caught up together with, you know, with the Lord in the air with those that, that are already asleep. And he's referring to the coming of the Lord. And then chapter 5 he says, but of the times and the season, you know, I don't need to write unto you. And he refers to the day of the Lord. Now, Jesus Christ coming back to this earth for the second coming I do not believe that event specifically is the day of the Lord, but I think the day of the Lord event and the day of Christ event happen on the same day. And we'll, we'll get into that in just a second here. That's all of these references to the, to the day of the Lord. Let's look at the day of Christ now. You could turn to these if you want. I'm going to try to go through these a little bit quickly just for sake of time. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to just read these real quick. If you want to you wanna jot them down or run through them, that's fine. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7. The Bible says, So that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And here's the contrast I want you to recognize and to notice, that when the day of Jesus or the day of Christ is mentioned, it's a positive reference. It's a good thing. It's something that we're looking forward to. The day of the Lord, bad thing, vengeance, sorrow, destruction, all kinds of bad things going on in the day of the Lord. The day of Christ, though, is a good thing. And he mentions here that you come behind in no gift. It's, it's, it's referring to gifts being given out and the day of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5 says, To deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Again, a positive thing, about the Spirit being saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 14 says, As also you have acknowledged us in part, that we are your rejoicing, even as ye also are ours, in the day of the Lord Jesus. We're talking about people being, hey, you're our rejoicing in the day of Christ. Happiness, good things, rejoicing. Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, verse number 6 reads, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. The good work, when God saves you, you have a new creature that's born inside of you, he says he's going to continue that work. He's going to perform that until the day of Jesus Christ. It's a good day that's coming. Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense, till the day of Christ. So he's referring to people being around and being here until the day of Christ. So this is something that, that the day of Christ will happen that we will, will be here for. 
being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. We will be here for all the way up until the day of Christ, or men in general. Maybe not you and I specifically, but people will be here until the coming until the day of Christ. Philippians chapter 2, verse 14 says, Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Again, Positive reference, rejoicing the day of Christ. Day of Christ is a good thing. Every time it's mentioned, the day of the Lord is a bad thing. So what's the difference between it? What is the day of Christ and what is the day of the Lord? Well, here in 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we're going to see our last reference here to the day of Christ, which gives us some more timing and understanding when this event is going to happen. Now we beseech you, brethren, verse number 1, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Now that's going to be a joyous day when Jesus Christ comes back. Hey, we're going to love to see Jesus Christ come back in the clouds. That is a great day for every believer who's ever lived. Because that's the day that the dead in Christ are going to rise. You're going to get a brand new body. You're going to be transformed in a, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. And that's the day that, that the people who are undergoing the tribulation and suffering persecution, they're going to be rescued. They're going to be saved out of this earth. Everyone's going to be looking forward to that day of Christ to that return, the coming of Jesus Christ in the clouds. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says, you know, we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. So the day of Christ, re, you know, recapping positive references, believers are looking for the day of Christ, and it won't occur, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, until the Antichrist is revealed, that son of perdition, right? Now, turn, if you would, to Matthew 24. It's the last place I'm going to have you turn. I promise. Last place to turn, Matthew 24. I'm just going to wrap up this whole thing. I know it, there's, there's a lot of content here. I know there's a lot of scripture Hopefully you're able to stick with it. And there's so much more about the day of the Lord. I didn't include all of it. I was trying to include, hopefully I didn't, I didn't beat a dead horse here just showing you all of the references about how bad it's going to be because it's God's wrath. Because it's absolutely terrible the things that are going to be happening um, on this earth. But the day of the Lord, the day of Christ. But we're going we're gonna, to, Matthew 24 kind of helps to, to, to get this picture in, in the right order. 2 Thessalonians 2, again, the day of Christ isn't going to come at least until the Antichrist is set up. Matthew 24 talks about the same event. Look at verse number 15. It says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. This is the same event that, that he's referring to about the, the man of sin being revealed in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It says, Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no nor ever shall be. And I can't you know, state this enough, as I did my, in my previous, in, during the prophecy week, I preached on this subject. People today, Christians today, have been brainwashed into thinking that the tribulation is a seven-year period and they're constantly confusing the great tribulation with the wrath of God and the two could not be more separated in the Bible. It's not possible. God has given clear distinctions between tribulation, great tribulation, and wrath and fierce anger being poured out by the Lord. The, the great tribulation that we see here is a result of human beings, of people, of the Antichrist, for one, leading the charge against Christians, against believers. 
That's why there's going to be a flight. There's not going to be a flight of people trying to leave because God's pouring out His wrath. The, the people that, that are trying to leave from God pouring out His wrath are getting into the caves and the dens of the rocks and saying, fall on us and hide us from the face of the Lord. Believers aren't going to be saying, hide us from the face of the Lord. They're going to be saying, amen, God's here. Take me home, God, because you're this son and he's your father. Two completely different things going on here. The great tribulation, he's talking to believers. He's talking to people who are going to be persecuted for the cause of Christ. Now, the timing of the day of the Lord, we saw a little bit of the timing of the day of Christ. The Antichrist has to be set up first, and then there's the day of Christ. The timing of the day of the Lord, I'll read from you from Joel 2.31. We didn't read this. The Bible says, The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood. Those are great, notable things are going to happen. Sun being dark and moon into blood. Before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. So just as in order for the day of Christ to come, the Antichrist has to be revealed first, there's an event that has to come before the day of the Lord comes, and that's the, the sun and the moon being darkened before that event that's referred to as the day of the Lord starts to occur. Ver Matthew 24, look at verse number 29. The Bible says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. These are the same exact things that have to happen before the great and terrible day of the Lord can come, right? The sun being dark, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the power of the heaven shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. That is the rapture. There is... Tribulation. So the day of the Lord, the day that God starts pouring out His wrath, we established that way earlier in the sermon, that is the day that, that signifies the beginning of God pouring out His wrath, a very negative day for those facing it. The sun and the moon goes dark before the beginning of the day of the Lord. So putting it all in perspective here, the timeline. Believers are going to be looking for the day of Christ. This is a positive reference. We're saying, hey, it's going to be a great thing. That's going to be the judgment seat of Christ is going to occur. God's going to be giving out gifts when he comes back. There's going to be a falling away and a great apostasy as referred to in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and tribulation is going to be happening during this time. As people are, are falling away and rejecting God, there's going to be a lot more hate towards Christians, people who are really doing the work of God. There's going to be a lot more people, there's going to be a lot more persecutions getting ramped up as the love of many waxes cold as people are, are, are getting away from God, it is going to drive the tribulation of people. Then, as these things are happening, the beginning of sorrows happens, the man of sin will be revealed, the Antichrist. He's going to stand in the temple of God declaring himself that he is God. That's the next thing that happens. And that starts the great tribulation. Believers are still here. He's going to go full force after God's people. You know, he's kicked out of heaven. Satan's kicked out of heaven. And now he's mad and he's angry. He's going to make war with the saints. The great tribulation comes. And then the sun and the moon get darkened. And Jesus Christ comes back in the clouds. The, the second coming of Christ. This event is the day of Christ. That is the event we're looking forward to. That is the good day, the glorious day that believers are looking for, saying, hey, all of these things have happened. We've gone through this great tribulation, as the Bible said that we would, but now Christ is coming back in the clouds. The sun and moon have just been darkened, and then boom, here comes Jesus Christ coming in the clouds. Rapture takes place. The very next event that happens is then God begins to pour out His wrath, which is the day of the Lord. And God's wrath then gets poured out for approximately three and a half years before the kingdom is finally set up in Jerusalem by Jesus Christ. So that day, I believe the, the events of the day of Christ happen on the very same day that the, the events of the day of the Lord start to happen. 
but it happens the day of Christ is they're separate from each other not separate days but separate events right the day of Christ is is the good news of us being caught up together in the clouds and that return of Christ the day of the Lord is God executing judgment upon this earth but they happen right right next to each other right you know one and then the other so they're not exactly the same thing but they happen on the same day so hopefully, you know, like I said, there's a, there's a lot of content here and, and I try to do my best with, with keeping this in a, in a matter that's easy to follow and, and you see the, definitely the stark contrast between the two days. But it is important for just understanding all the events that are going to be taking place and to get this rooted down, what is going to happen and to have the clear scriptural evidence of what's going to happen in the end times. So let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the clear teaching from Scripture, dear Lord, and, and for giving us some, some wisdom and knowledge that we wouldn't be um, shaken in our faith when the, when the tribulation occurs and starts to happen, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us to warn others from the, the great day of the Lord, from the day of your great wrath, when you finally say enough is enough and your, and your long suffering and your mercy comes to a halt and, uh, and you decide to take action and bring judgment upon the wicked men of this earth, dear Lord. We thank you for our salvation and for forgiving us and pardoning our iniquities, dear Lord. And we look forward to that great day of Christ that's going to happen where Jesus Christ will come back and gather together as elect from the four winds of heaven, dear Lord. We are looking so forward to that event. I pray that you would please use us before that time comes to do as much work as possible to, to bring people to you that we can rejoice with the others that are brought together with you in the clouds, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.